introduce uh, two, uh, two wonderful published writers. Okay, uh, we've, we've ended up being, um, we've, we've, we've ended up uh, clumping a lot of the established writers at the beginning and also the established writers whose names start with J. We've got Jason Lee, and next we will have Gerald Yam and Jasmine Sia. Uh, Jasmine, as I said, is the co-curator of this event. Gerald it has just published um, his uh, two, his first two books. They're just, they just out of NS, right? Yeah, they're doing first year of university. Wow, so old. <laughs> And there's two books, uh, Chasing Curtain Sons and, uh, and what's the other name of the other? And Scattered Vertebrae are on sale oh, right over there, published by Books actually. Um, yes, please, uh, Gerald and Jasmine. <laughs> I'm going to be in second year. I'm studying law at University College London, and this is my summer break. It's my first contradiction event, so thank you, Isha, for inviting me to be here. <laughs> so with um, Jasmine and I are going to alternate poems. Um, the first one that um, I'm going to start with is from Scattered Vertebrae. This collection talks about reconciling the tensions between family, religion, and sexuality. Um, I don't know, it's really on thin ice here, but I'm Christian, and I personally do not think that it is irreconcilable. So there are some poems in this collection that talk about this um, process of, you know, discovering whether there is really, in fact, some sort of like unsuitability, you know, can you still be Christian and gay? So the first poem is entitled Audition. It's about me imagining, you know, the rest of my friends in church. Yeah. Audition. When I see friends sprinting to the altar, their legs broken and fallen on the carpet before the cross, I thank you for the work done to their lives. Some shake uncontrollably, others wail, a long, languorous note as if the soul is creeping out from the flaccid shell of their bodies and given utterance. And when they lay hands over me, faces wet with divine recognition, I try to feel you churning, gasping, in the center of my chest, like the zygote feeding and growing on its mother's blood. Are there people unaccounted for in your grandiose universe plans, left out and put away at the spark of creation? I see my friends, so sure of salvation they can die contented at 21, how valiantly your call is answered, how fiercely they claimed places at your table. I will or will not know why you made me this way. I take my place in pews of austere wood, a stranger let in on charity, left to do the dirty work. Thank you. So anyway, I thought um, I would write a bunch of poems for contradiction. Um, I wanted to appeal to a very kind of like universal lesbian experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, first, the first being the one where, you know, you are a lesbian and you fall in love with a repressed, supposedly non-lesbian religious woman. <laughs> Uncommon experience. Please raise your hand if you understand what I'm talking about. Or don't. <laughs> okay. So, so that so that was that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So some of the problem. And some of the problem is that there is none. I'm sitting in this room with a bit of shade. The shades are drawn, but they've been since September. The chairs are exactly as we left them, still deep in conversation, 
pictures of you and I gawk at us, laughing at the empty with the stupidity of crumpled and forgotten pantomimes we watched at Christmas because this is a world in which we never get married. The years passed and your line drawn through my life, your edges touching everyone, my mother, my half-brother, and even the neighbor's dog. But in yours, I'm still that fleeting friend, that extraordinarily good friend who you occasionally, sporadically, take holidays with, with, with extraordinary effort. Sometimes they ask about you. I met your mother twice, I think. You left, and left so much with me. And the sum of the problem is that I can't go back to my technicolor set, and you went back to your white lie, its perfect linen sheets, its white, blameless lines, a world in which we did not get married, and the picture of you and I is fading against a green sky. Ishan chose. It was this experimental poem for my first collection, Chasing Curtain Sons, which was published um, last May. Um, this poem, right, actually uh, is about like 20 lines, but then it's numbered, so it's 1 to 20. Yeah, it's quite weird, actually. But this poem, I mean, this collection, right, talks about the transition from adolescence to adulthood. You know how, you know, it's important you need to move on, and moving on also means letting go, it means leaving behind. So it's not just like, you know, don't want to move, it's your problem. You know, there are a lot of other considerations you have to take into account. So, this poem is entitled, Things We Mistake for Vows. Number one, wine glasses purring in foam cots, a mug's coffee tattoo. Number two, children imagine what and how toothbrushes communicate. The usual suspects, rent over hygiene, space over sanity. Number three, not here. All curtains and no visitors, no tourists to make the bids. Number four, rambling even in your snores, sheets easing, exhaling, then wrenched taut with the weight of appointments we have failed to continue without, but narrowly. Number five, is a lullaby, is a memo stuck on oblivion. Of all compromises, we sacrifice the least deserving ones. Number six, you laugh when I say the phone is hanging by a thread. Outside, trees become charlatans preparing to flinch. Number seven, an ash tray, a fireplace dormant with memories of ignition. Pull my collar like a fuse, pencil each stretch mark like fuel. Number eight, seriously, toothbrushes? Number nine, I failed joke, sorry, sorry. Okay. Number nine, what the calendar, number nine, what the calendar advertises, it does not betray, it is no oracle. Number 10, hands gripping sky, pair of forgivers trying. A star withers, crumbles, and breaks. You whisper, we're all young, eventually. This part is a rearrangement of the lyrics from Young Blood by the Naked and Famous. Yeah. Number 11, rudimentary apology of languishing aphorisms, law and GTG, and by the way, dinner. Number 12, also in the morning, milk embracing its expiration date. Your breath on my nape shivers like a deadline. Number 13. Some 12-step programs begin with triumph. Oh, yonder sunlight simmering at the window's edge like Cointreau. Number 14. Dust claims proximity to everything but alternatives. This means commitment. Number 15. If mom walks in on us, Plunge to the floor and pretend you're looking for something. I'll still be asleep. Number 16. It may or may not rain. Fog must be slept away. On a day like this, Eleanor Roosevelt wakes to a future trivialized by the beauty of her dreams. Number 17. 
Pop and Go, Prozac on the Rocks. Number 18, 6th of January 2011. I feel your chest emblazoned on my back, our legs embroidered like branches. Dear, dear diaries. Number 19, you never know what season it is. Just snow masquerading as perfume, a loss of control, a stain to remember how good it feels. Number 20, these are not maternal warnings for the sleaze of running water. Thank you. Well, the first thing I want to say is rest in peace, Seamus Heaney. It's a very sad day. Collectively. <laughs> okay, so this one, um, this one I wrote for one of my favorite people who's sitting in the front row, Iris Giudotta. Okay, um, right here. Okay, so this one is called My Friend. My friend the musician is writing tonight, delving through folders of the women who have ever come and gone like a verified collection of ghosts and bottles scattered across a lonely beach. And she's testing the line for the resonance, waiting for it to sigh like a sleeping girl, surprised by the falling rain, making a sound like broken glass on the pavement then easy, easy falling back as quickly into the shape of her back in her bed, dreaming of fireworks or cigarettes, she can't tell, except the voice at 3 a.m. sings, it can be better without her head stuck in a lock. Though later, watching the sun spilling, she stares at bare feet aligned with beige tiles. The improbability of toes, thinking it would be a good idea to take them off, just cleanly slice them off. So the last um, two poems that both of us are going to read, uh, the one for me is entitled Gift. It's from Scattered Vertebrae as well. And um, this poem is about me coming up to my sister in the middle of like the Orchard Road crowd. So like, actually it's very funny, like, I was about to bring my sister to a hair salon at Chiwa Chang, like, which street mother does that, right, seriously? <laughs> so like, <laughs> yeah, so of course, like, the emotions that I felt, you know how every time you tell someone, especially the people that are close to you, it feels like, you know, you're admitting to some sort of crime that you've never committed. So, <clears throat> and, and this poem, again, is about me talking to God, huh? yeah. Okay. Not that one, not the real one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gift. Even as you change me, patiently oiling the ridges of my bolts, I know I am not alone. It could have been much worse. No home to call my own. Dysfunctional pieces of a family unhappy with who they are given mimicking my inner struggles on the vanguard of the merciless open. This is when I thank you for my sister. When I told her at a bustling junction mired in the Orchard Road crowd, my worries getting the better of me, my eyes pulling back its timid floodgates, how I would never get married to have children, to be the golden boy my parents would market as the epitome of Christ-likeness, their own pat on the back. She looped her arm over my back to say, don't worry, okay, I'll always be here for you. All my life, I had waited to be a victim of the generosity of love. And I tried my best gathering achievements like a harvest to please my parents who still imagine work as sacrifice. All my life I had wanted family that restrained themselves from the hypocrisy of judgment. All I know is this, my sister is the mercy, the family I never asked for, but which has always wished for me to belong. Thank you.
So the last poem I'm going to read is um, about another universal experience, not really a lesbian one, just falling in love. Um, I particularly, oh, I particularly wrote it for that person sitting over there. Yeah, she made the pasta, not me. <coughs> oh, that's, that's what you need, someone who makes pasta for you. Okay. Um, this thing I'm trying to say. This thing that I'm trying to say is the language of birds at sunset. I'd like to take the idea of snow on a quiet October morning and walk up a rainy street with you. That's me. <laughs> I can never speak this language to crowds. What we are is an instrument in waves, implausible, discordant, and also a little like a shell that twines itself in opposition to a divine ratio. Writing about being gay and in love is almost boring because it's like any other person in love wanting to put their arms around you, like stone angels in the cold with their granite wings gathered around a phantom small fire. Except for the fact that when I say that in the darkness my fingers want to read your body like lines in the Bible, it's just that much more this famous. But the thing I'm trying to say is, I want to wear your love like an old shirt. Write your name in the sand with you as close as possible. Thank you.